You know, Ben, many of us assume we know why uh, people come to this country and take up residence here, sin papeles, without papers. But in your case, we have someone who is, in fact, living under those circumstances who can answer that question for us. Why did you leave your home in Mexico and come to the U.S.? I was looking for a better life, uh, something I cannot have in Mexico. In Mexico, if you're a small farmer, you stay a small farmer all of your life. And I was looking for opportunities to, to learn. Okay. Uh, tell us about your childhood, where you lived, what it was like for you. Oh, I grew up in a very remote part in Guerrero, Mexico. There was only like four or five houses there. The only way to get there, you have to walk through this little trail from about 45 minutes from a small town in Camalote. And uh, I live over there with my mother, father, two brothers, and one sister. No running water, no electricity, no toilet. Very simple life. Now, how, how many people lived in this community? Oh, about 40, maybe 45. Uh, how, did, how did you survive? How did you make a living? It's a good question. <laughs> we eat whatever we can get from the farm, not much. We raise some chickens, pigs, some goat. Also, we raise some corn, beans, tomatoes. And uh, sometimes we have to sell some eggs or chickens to buy things for the house. And for that, I have to walk all the way to El Camalote, take a little, that little trail again, and go to the store and sell my chickens or eggs and buy whatever I can. And uh, I remember I want to buy a candy all the time. I never have extra money. Now I think it's funny, but back then, that wasn't that funny. I'm sure it was <laughs> not funny. <laughs> so what about school? Oh, I went to school in El Camalote. I remember getting up at uh, 5 in the morning and take a bath and this little river was very cold water. <laughs> then I have to walk to El Camalote. Sometimes I got over there, the teachers, they didn't show up, or they'd be drunk. Drunk, <laughs> <laughs> teachers. So I have to walk back home and try again the next day. Sometimes I keep trying for a week. Finally, I learned to read and write a little bit, so I left the school after three years. And I went and worked full time uh, with my father in the fields. Third grade, working in the fields. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like a really tough life. Yes, maybe that was a normal life for people over there. Or maybe we didn't have any other choice. But I think I have a good childhood. Okay, a good childhood. Uh, yet you chose to leave that life and to come to the United States. Why did you make that choice? And, and tell us the, the details about your leaving, what that was like. Well, you know, even when I was little, I have dreams. I remember when I was about six years old, my father gave me a female calf, and he didn't have that many, he had only like six. So after a few years, I have a little group of cows. <laughs> but that was like a little business, but I cannot get anywhere with that. I, uh, I talked to my friend who used to live in Orcas Island, and he told me how beautiful was this place. I remember asking him, uh, do you think I can find work over there? He said, yes, uh, I think you can work in the restaurant, washing dishes. <laughs> and I thought, oh, OK, maybe I can, I can do that. It's a good opportunity. And I asked him, uh, can I come with you? He said, yes. He told me I'm going to leave next week. So in a week, I sold all my cows to make money for that trip. And that wasn't that easy, because I remember saying, that if something goes wrong with this trip, I'm going to be back in home with nothing. I'm going to be broke. Okay. And I understand you're 22 at this time. Yeah. And, and, and you are about to embark on a very long journey, 2,500 miles at least. Describe the trip. Yes, I walked down to the city. That was like 3 o'clock in the morning. I walked for about six hours. And then we got in a car, and we got to the airport in Zihuatanejo. 
We got on a plane over there, my first time in a plane to Mexico City. I remember when the plane was getting down, down in Mexico City, I looked through the window and I know this wasn't El Camalote, <laughs> not like where I grew up. <laughs> that was a huge city and I remember my heart started going like <laughs> And then going inside in the airport, seeing all these different faces, different people, that was a big surprise for me too. From there, uh, we flew to Tijuana and we hired somebody over there to help us to cross the border. A coyote? Yeah, we call them a coyote. Yeah. The next day, we went to Mexicali with him by bus and we crossed over there uh, in the countryside near Mexicali. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you were on foot when you actually crossed the border, is that right? Yes, the walking part, that wasn't too bad. I walked for three hours maybe, but we, uh, we spent a couple of days at night sleeping in the side of the road anywhere we could. And this was December, that was super cold. And I didn't have the right clothes either. Uh, I remember I was doing this because too cold and I was shaking. And then I tried to get up and my whole body was shaking from the cold. I remember thinking if I spend one more night here, I'm gonna die from the cold. <laughs> from there, finally they took us to three different places maybe, and we took a bus to Seattle. But we have to get to Bellingham, and we took a taxi. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Wait a minute, you took a taxi from Seattle to Bellingham? Yeah, and we didn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we went to Bellingham because my friend no people there. So we told the driver, those people, they're going to pay you over there. And he trusted uh, us. He trusted you. So he took us over there, and yes, they pay him $180, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day, we got to Orcas Island. That was December 1498, and that was 14 days after I left my home in Mexico. And I was broke, I didn't speak any English, and I was cold and hungry too. Well, it sounds like you were very much in need of un milagro, a miracle. Yes, uh, Jack Helsos and his wife, they are my milagros. <laughs> they, uh, they give me some work and they let me live in the uh, old house, very close to the summer. How was the house? Oh, it's, a, it's an old house, pretty rustic. <laughs> Not like the other houses in Orcas Island, but <laughs> have electricity, running water, heat. And I remember walking down to work in the morning and then back at night. And I feel like a rich man with work and place to sleep. So you, you settled in, and I'm assuming then you became the Sawyer, right? Oh, no, no, when, the, when I first came to Orcas, I didn't know how to drive a car. <laughs> I never worked with a heavy machine. I started over there splitting firewood, and I helped a sawyer with whatever he need, move lumber and anything he need. But I was watching that sawyer every chance I got, because I want to learn. Mm -hmm. I remember I got two by sixes my first time. Okay, let's, let's back up just a minute. You arrived on Orcas, you spoke no English, you understood no English. How did you get along? How did you cope? Oh, uh, this is funny. One time I was working over there and I saw a car coming up. <laughs> what I did, I ran and hide inside the shop. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, you saw a customer coming. Yeah, for sure that was a customer. Yeah, and you, you ran and you hid. I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> Probably not real good for Jack's business. But it wasn't that long before you could communicate with Jack, with his family, with the customers. How did that come about? Yes, well, you know, Jack Helzo, my, I call him Patron, he helped me a lot. He took me to different places in his property. As he was trying to explain me what to do. And I remember he was talking and he was point, pointing with his finger and he kept doing that. But I didn't understand almost nothing. But he was a good teacher. He helped me a lot. 
And then I, uh, I met a neighbor, Natalie White, but she was 75 years old mm -hmm. and she needed a lot of help. She used a walker to get around her place. And so I started going over there and she teach English before. I mean, she teaches, she was an English teacher. English so she, as a second language. Yeah, 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 that's what yeah, I'm trying to say, sure. sorry. So she helped me a little bit, and also I learned with the customers at the summit when I stopped running away. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember I throw all my, uh, my Mexican music away, and I start listening to the country music. <laughs> So if my English is not perfect, plain thing. Plain country music. Yeah. Okay. How long then, you've now picked up some English, how long before you're ready to take over the Sawyer's job? How long was it before you actually did take it over? Oh, that was after two years working over there. The other guy stopped working over there. But I wasn't ready. Really? I remember when Jack told me, you want to do it? No, he said, you can do it. So I, he offered me the, oppor the opportunity, and I took it. Working in a sawmill is just about the most dangerous job imaginable. I, I just have to ask, why would Jack give you this job? And maybe even more important, why would you take it? Yeah, it is dangerous. <laughs> but... That, uh, that was a good opportunity for me. I remember when the, he offered me the job, I asked him, do you think I can do it? And he said, yes. But in the beginning, I, uh, I remember I called him sometimes like three times a day, asking him questions because that was hard for me. But it took me a long time to learn when I can feel like I, can, I could control the machines. Like about six years. Before that, I think they controlled me. <laughs> Well, you, you, you've obviously mastered the controlling of these machines, uh, so much so that, that Jack and many, many contractors and homeowners and woodworkers would all say, you are irreplaceable. How does that make you feel? Oh, I feel very lucky. I mean, I'm doing the best I could, and I like to make customers happy and have a good life and a good time. So good life? Yeah. Is it really? I think so. I mean, I've, I just want to ask you this. I've, I've heard that you rarely left the property, especially early on. Why? Most of the time I was busy working. And also what happened, my father died in 2001. In the same day, my mother got so sick, so she went to the hospital. So I was trying to work as much as I could to send money to her because she didn't have any money and I didn't want to waste any time, and that cost a lot of money. And also, uh, I was afraid to go off the island and get stopped by the police or border patrol, and they could send me back to Mexico. I remember each time I go anywhere, I was checking the brake lights in my car, <laughs> make sure everything works. Uh, my biggest fear was getting at the ferry, going out and then getting back to the island. And yet? One day in 2008, you did take the ferry, you did leave the island, and your world was turned upside down. What happened? Yes, that day all my dreams went down. Uh, my neighbor, Natalie White, she had a stroke on March 3rd, 2008. The EMT wanted to take her off the island to the hospital by air, but she was afraid to fly. So she told them the only way she can go if I take it. And when if they, you take it. Yeah. So when they asked me, I said, yes. Before I leave the island, uh, her doctor told me to be careful with her. Don't, don't, don't make her angry. But <laughs> getting in the other side, in, in Anna Cores, I saw all this border patrol asking people questions. I don't know what. And this boat was not, not international boat. This boat was from Orcas Island to Anacores. When they got to my car, well, before they got to my car, when he saw me, I thought he was going to jump through the window and get me. I was like a million dollars for him. Like a, like a big catch? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he asked me, where are you from, and do you have papers? 
And I was honest, I told him the true big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, I, I'm taking this lady to the hospital and I showed a paper from the doctor, but he didn't care. I, uh, I, thought, I thought Natalie was gonna die over there. And he told me to pull over. After maybe 10 or 15 minutes, uh, one of them took her to the hospital. And then they took me to three different places and then down to Tacoma Detention Center. And they were getting ready to send me back to Mexico. But Jack Helsos, my boss, he found a, a lawyer, immigration lawyer. And my friend loaned me some money so I can pay a bond and wait for my uh, deportation ca case an Orcas and not in detention center. A stinky place, I can tell you that. A stinky. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go back again. It's not clean. What happened to Natalie? Oh, she died. Two weeks later, after I lost my deportation case, she died. You know, I've heard that she was extremely guilty, feeling extremely guilty, felt that she was at fault, that you had been picked up by ICE, by immigration, and that she had stopped taking her meds as a result of that. Yes, uh, she was very unhappy with the government. I told her so many times, it's not your fault. But I don't know, anything is possible. One thing I know, I, uh, I miss her a lot. Ring us up to date, please, Ben. You've lost a dear friend. You lost your deportation hearing. You lost the appeal of that decision. Now, it is true that you've had several stays of, 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 of the uh, deportation, uh, and one as recently as two or three months ago. How did that one come about? Oh, the Helsos, uh, Jack Helsos, my boss, he told the government and his family to uh, how, how important is my work for their business? And also the Seattle time and the Island Sounder and Orcas issue, issue. Mm -hmm. they wrote a big stories about my case. But the Orcas community, that support help a lot. And uh, if it's not for all that support, especially the Orcas community, I not be here today. I be the porter in Mexico. Why don't you just get married? <laughs> uh, I've heard as recently as two days ago <laughs> that Natalie, before she became so ill, was approaching everybody from Deer Harbor to East Sound and asking this question verbatim. Do you know any virgins? <laughs> <laughs> now, on the, on the serious side of that, I, I have heard that it is pretty easy for an immigrant to get a green card by marrying a U.S. citizen. You know, she was asking people off the island, too. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to your question, yeah. yeah, that sounds very easy, but it's not that easy especially for me because my deportation, even if I married to American citizens, I wish I could, that don't work for me. I have to go back to Mexico for 10 years and then apply. Because of the deportation yeah. order. And then maybe wait 100 years for my green card. <laughs> but there is one more thing. When I went down to Tacoma Detention Center and then I go down to Taquila a lot, to talk to ICE immigration. I saw this young American lady, she came over there looking for her Latino husband. And I saw those tears coming from her eyes and she just was shaking her head. That broke my heart. I don't wanna do that to somebody. I mean, I don't wanna get married and then leave family behind because that's not gonna be easy for me and not easy for them either. Of course. Ben, what, what is missing from your life here on Orcas? Oh, of course, my family. Uh, I wish I can go and see them, but you know, my dream is live here the rest of my life, buy a house and 
be here. But yeah, I wish I can see my family. I haven't seen them for 16 years. But it's, it's funny because when I came here, I want to stay only for three or four years. But I saw all the opportunities to learn. After 16 years, I'm still here. Yeah. It's your home. Feels like. Okay. Now, many of my former colleagues in law enforcement, not all, but probably most, and many, many others, would say to you, you don't belong here. You entered this country, uh, country unlawfully. You're a criminal. You are an illegal alien. What do you say to them? Well, you know, I don't agree with them. I don't think uh, no human is illegal alien. <laughs> and I don't feel like criminal because I've been here for 16 years paying my taxes. And some of them, they say we use the government money. I'm not using the government money. I'm paying my taxes. <laughs> And uh, I wish they stop calling names, people like me. But you know, that is one thing I like about the US. It's a free country, so people can say whatever they want. <laughs> I cannot change the way they think. But that doesn't mean I agree with them. If they go back 100 years or 238 years ago, they're going to find out uh, their families came here just like me, looking for a better life and opportunities. Without papers. Yeah, without papeles here. <laughs> and finally, Ben, you have so many friends and supporters uh, on this island and beyond. Uh, and one of those friends and supporters who I understand uh, has, has offered you some advice, some counsel, is U.S. Uh, Senator Patty Murray. And I understand further that you had a private one-on-one -on -one conversation with her not long ago. What, what, what did she say to you? Yes, that was a big day for me. Uh, she told me, uh, ICE immigration want to send you home. She said, don't go anywhere. Orcas Island is your home. And then she said, keep fighting. And then she said, very quiet and keep all your friends. Because <laughs> she knows if it's not for the Orcas community, I'm not be here today. Uh, I want to leave the last word for, for you, Ben, but I do want to say that I cannot thank you enough for the education you have given me. I can't thank you enough uh, for sharing your personal story and for putting a human face to the complexities and the, and the thorny issues of, of immigration. I know that come May 6th, 2015, you are Mexico bound for good unless something between now and then happens. And I sincerely hope that that happens for you. Final thoughts. I want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you to the Orcas community for all the support. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ellie, for all the work you've done for me. <laughs> thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And gracias por entrevistarme. Muchas gracias. De nada.